This is Window on the East, a podcast from BNE IntelliNews. Subscribe at bne.eu. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another BNE podcast uh, with me, Ben Aris, the editor in chief of BNE IntelliNews. Um, today, we're going to get away from uh, doing perennial Russia Ukraine podcasts and look at Uzbekistan, which has come to an exciting stage in the privatization program where the state is rolling out a string of big, the first big IPOs. The so stakes on offer are going to be small, but um, this is really a revolutionary moment where um, the state's now started actively trying to get out of the economy and hand it over to private enterprise. I have a distinguished lineup of guests today, um, starting with Karen um, Sarapov, uh, Sar- 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 Polonov, sorry, I'm just tripping over my tongue, who is the managing director of Avesta, um, which is one of Central Asia's leading um, brokerages and investment banks. Um, we're also joined by uh, Behruz uh, Olchilov, who's uh, an investment banker in, in uh, Tashkent with Freedom Finance. Um, that has an interesting story. It started off in Russia, then headquarters in Kazakhstan before moving to New York, where it's listed, and a specialist in investment banking across um, Eurasia, Central Asia. Um, we're also joined by uh, Eleanor Kramer. She's a head of IR at Artel, which is Central Asia's biggest white goods manufacturer and probably one of the top three leading companies in Uzbekistan and probably the number one privately owned enterprise in the country. And finally, um, we're joined by Aziz uh, Solikov, um, who's from the Ministry of Finance and he's a head of IP creation in Uzbekistan and is the point man for driving this whole campaign to privatize using the local stock market. So to begin with, um, I think we go to Aziz, um, who says uh, to make some introductory remarks as a representative of the government um, and the program that's just going. We just heard some exciting news that Uzavda, one of our three companies, has just announced its pricing. So um, the flag is waved, the uh, race has begun. But Aziz, please, um, Tell us what's going on. What's the plan here? So, good afternoon and good evening. Nice to meet you all today. Thank you for giving the opportunity to speak about the local capital market of Uzbekistan. It's very uh, so, Uzbekistan continues to be strong in its transition to a more market economy. The country is committed to improving its productive capacity and just on the way to. So numerous economies, state-owned enterprise and banking sector reform. Now that this country has entered the next phase of market reforms, be fundamental for further market capitalization. Or to this is creating a, a more competitive and efficient corporate sector by transforming SOEs and SOB, as well as pushing forward on privatization. Perhaps most promising for the country's uh, future is a the ambitious program being undertaken to expand to expand its local capital market. Uh, by strengthening the equity market, the country affordable capital will ultimately become accessible to companies across all industry sectors. In this sense, the government of Uzbekistan, with a strong commitment, is initiating local and national IPOs of SPOs of 23 national champions over the next two years. Out of these 23 SOEs, there are six are six of them are state-owned banks and five are insurance and financial companies, three metals and mining representatives, and the rest are SOEs that are operating in the oil and gas, transportation, logistics, automobile manufacturing, and pharmaceutical industry. And the pioneers of such wide-scale IPO agenda are Uzafta Motors, Uzmed Caminas, and Shoko. Now, the development of the capital market is on uh, the management of Ministry of Finance. From the uh, from perspective of capital market development, we will focus more on the local listings. However, pre IPO and IPO preparation processes will be based on the international best practices and standards, which will allow us to properly prepare for international listings that we being followed later on. Thank you. Great. 
Um, as I said in the intro, that um, the three companies that are up for IPO are Uzavto, which is uh, the biggest uh, car producer. It was formerly, um, originally, it was a joint venture with Daewoo, but then got taken over by GM, the American company. And then more recently, GM pulled out. Uh, and so now it's fully state-owned. Uh, and the bizarre thing, if you go to Tashkent, is the entire country seems to be full of Chevrolets, and they're all white. Um, they're all produced by this one uh, uh, factory, uh, which has a 95% market share, uh, but now it's being privatized and should be very interesting and going through various reforms and the uh, protectionist um, duties that it's enjoyed till now have been taken down in order to spur competition. The second company is Uds Met um, Combinat, which is the country's largest steel producer. I think a third of the steel in the country is consumed uh, is Uds Met. And uh, the fourth, uh, third company is QQB, which is a former agricultural-based bank, um, but is now transformed to a universal bank and is the country's largest mortgage lender. And happily, uh, Karen and uh, Bert Cruz, um, between them are representing and helping to prepare all three of those companies. So, um, <clears throat> Bert Cruz, maybe we can go to you uh, first, in so much as, um, as you said, there's a capital market state going on at the moment for, um, was after, uh, and they've just announced the pricing, um, which is going to be a key element, as I think we'll discuss, um, to get the, the, these IPOs away. They've got to be cheap enough in order to bring in fresh capital. But can you tell us a bit about um, Uzavto um, and the pricing? I think it's just been valued at 2.8 billion. And we were talking before this started, you're saying that's actually at the low end of the scale. That's quite a cheap valuation, which is a good thing, is it not? Yeah, so we valued Zalto at uh, $2.18 billion. So uh, that's the fair value. And we're placing it at the discount of uh, uh, discount range of 10 to 20 percent. So, and the, co the company itself, I mean, to go into a little bit of detail, I was at your presentation yeah. at the, um, the Economic Forum. I mean, it really is a force in the market in so much as it produced yeah. something like 280,000 cars last year. It's on yeah, three, 300. Yeah, now it produces about uh, 340,000 cars. Uh, Uzad Motors is uh, the, the largest automotive producer and uh, uh, CIS. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it, it operates with the GM. So um, in alliance with GM produces Chevrolet cars. It mm -hmm. holds uh, 90, over 90% 90 of the of market share uh, in Uzbekistan over 40% market share in Kazakhstan, rapidly pushing into new markets in the post-Soviet republics. Um, and uh, the, one of the best parts about the company and uh, is uh, because of its alliance with GM, uh, it doesn't have to spend anything on R&D. So uh, it will be um, grow, growing much, uh, much faster and uh, uh, have, will have much better margins than any other automotive company at the at the same size. So also it has the uh, it has the exclusive rights from GM to sell Chevrolets in this post-Soviet Republic. So uh, no one else can import Chevrolets other than uh, Uzauto Motors to Kazakhstan, to Armenia, to Kyrgyzstan, etc. And it's got two big drivers of growth. Um, one is the low cost base. I mean, there's a big factory in Andijan that was set up there in the, the 90s. I mean, Karimov did that as one of the yeah. few really good deals he did. And the second one is the population growth. That Uzbekistan has got the yeah. fastest growing population. So from 400,000 production predicted for this year is expected to rise to 500,000. And that's simply because there's more people need to buy cars. Yeah, and what's the outlook there? Yeah, it's not just uh, that there are more people, but uh, also that the GDP per capita is growing. Right now, if you look at the correlation matrix of the uh, owning of cars, uh, car ownership per thousand people, uh, there is just 87 people in per thousand people owning cars in Uzbekistan. That's much lower than Kyrgyzstan, which has double of that. It's lower than in Turkmenistan, in Armenia, in many post-Soviet republics. Russia is at about 400. Uh, cars per thousand people. So, if uh, so, our projections is that um, Uzavto will uh, the car ownership in Uzbekistan will move to 140 cars per thousand people, and that will allow Uzavto Motors to uh, produce much more uh, to have uh, a bigger market for its cars. Mm. We did a drill down into the um, car ownership. I mean, you have to take into account 
looking at the numbers, also the age of the car. Um, and Russia has yeah. a high has a high proportion of cars per capita, but then a lot of them are quite old. Um, yeah. although, although it still has, from the CIS, um, it has a very high share of new cars. But Uzbekistan has must have extremely high share of new cars. Yeah, so um, actually, Ozark Motors uh, numbers from uh, basically the also the models, uh, they went from an um, average of uh, 11 years for a model, so um, uh, to four years uh, in a forecast for the next year. So that will be the average age of the models they produce. So there's are and, all freshly new approved models from GM. And a last question before we get on to the more general topics. Um, what about the financial performance of the company? Um, as I said, it has this local production and in the presentation, uh, the deputy chairman was saying that, look, we have a very competitive position because, um, and this is another one of Uzbekistan's strengths, is that the cost of labor here is very low and that we can produce cars much cheaper than any imports that come in. We can really you know, compete on price and, and cost. But the company itself is, is pretty profitable, is it not? Yeah, the company is pretty profitable on, it, uh, it earned uh, 215 uh, million dollars for the last 12 months and we're projecting uh, uh, grow, um, a lot of growth to 2026-2027 uh, so uh, right now basically the uh, uh, so uh, right now the company is earning uh, about uh, three and a half uh, billion dollars in revenue and we're projecting uh, $5.3 billion in revenue by 2026. That's thanks to introducing more um, uh, more models, so newer models, and to uh, replacing low margin models with the uh, higher margin ones. Okay. Karen, if I can come to you, can we do the same with Uzmet uh, Combinat, um, which again, as I say, is um, it's a huge plant that was set up in the 40s um, and it's had uh, at least a billion dollars invested in it since the, the end of the Soviet Union and has gone from just making sort of basic steel to adding new products like gases um, and now it's moving on to hot rolled steel from long products um, which are much more marketable and the output is expected to double from a million tons a year to two million if I remember rightly. Um, what, what, tell me a bit about this company, why, why it's so interesting for an IPO. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben, for your invitation and giving the chance to uh, give you a bit of description about the company. Uh, more or less the same is, is very, very uh, the same for the, for the Udmet Kambinat, but who said macroeconomically, it's, it's a great company. It's supported by the growing uh, income and uh, highly growing construction segment in Texas because they uh, uh, they could sell everything they produce like three times uh, on the local market and the prices are quite transparent on the local commodity exchange. Uh, everything is very, very uh, transparent for all the sides of the project. They don't have the issues with the getting money from the payers, uh, which is quite usual for local and companies in CIS. Uh, this guy, they are getting money strictly from the commodity exchange for most of their products. Uh, as you said, the, the, the probable company now producing the long products like rebars and others and the grinding balls for the uh, another mining companies in Uzbekistan. And now they are uh, increasing the capacity by 2.5 times, and not just in that, that area that they are doing, but adding the hot rolling flat metal, which will be then uh, galvanize it and use it for some any industry in Uzbekistan, like FMCG production, um, some construction, whatever. Uh, so the company have a great uh, opportunities. They already practically guaranteed the financing of this great project. So they, they, they the main project is valued for 700 million and definitely management have a lot of other plans for modernization the plant, but it's definitely they are limited with the with the size uh, and some financial covenants. If, if it just you to imagine they uh, that the $700 million projects is more or less their annual revenues right now. But when the project was starting, they have like twice lower revenue. So they actually supposed to uh, do the project, which is two times more than, more than they, they now. Uh, so this, 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 this is the advantage that 
uh, with the companies could help in, in this growing market. So they could afford very, very prospective projects. Mm. Uh, what else did that? So I, we, we did some, some, some very basic calculations now and we see that the, uh, the price uh, for the for the Udmet combinat shares now is more or less the same. Uh, the dynamics, so it's practically 100% correlated with their uh, profit dynamics. Uh, in 2021, there was a very good uh, increase in prices for the metal. They had good profits. Now it's a bit uh, lower. Uh, that's that's like a risk for all cyclical seasonal uh, products. But we, on the other hand, we see that all the efforts of the management of the company to improve the reporting, to improve the corporate governance, to improve the quality and cost uh, of, the, of, of the production. But all this is not reflected in the price. So we see the, that uh, the IPO will bring additional liquidity to the market, will bring some additional qualified investors who will be able to do the proper uh, understanding of this, this, this values. And uh, this will transfer in, in a much better pricing for the, for the shares. Mm -hmm. Could you also give us a brief sketch of QQB? I mean, again, as I know, it's like one of the top 10 banks and uh, formerly a specialist on the agricultural sector where it's sort of getting into housing. And now as part of the new strategy is transforming into a universal bank, but it's kept that interest in housing and it's the largest mortgage lender. And the mortgage sector, um, the housing sector, I mean, this is an economic growth driver. You mentioned construction is booming and the expanding population, there's a constant demand for housing um, and the government is subsidizing mortgages too in order to drive this along and to make housing affordable for all the young people. And so the bank sits in quite a sweet spot. For sure, for sure, yeah. Uh, I guess the, the one of the main main metrics, as, as B. Cruz was telling you about the, the, the penetration of the cars to the thousand people, I could say that Uzbekistan have one of the lowest uh, average uh, residential space for per capita. It's just about 17, less than 17 square meters. Uh, so obviously that these numbers will be growing and the current growth in construction is confirming this growth. Uh, so the bank itself is probably one of the most uh, profitable and uh, well-managed banks among the state-owned banks. Definitely, we, 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 we honestly could say that this uh, two universe of the banks, the private banks in Uzbekistan and the state-owned banks. Uh, but for the last four years, the bank did a very good job on uh, cleaning the, the balance sheet, improving the procedures, introducing the, the IT and new uh, management strategy. So it, everything of this turns in, in a decreasing of the, of the costs, increasing of the net margin. So the bank is now showing about 18% uh, RE. Uh, and growing very fast. So the only limit for them is their, their capital adequacy ratio and the requirements of the central bank, which is quite tough in Uzbekistan. Uh, but with, with, with the possible IPO, uh, yes, they, they raise very small sum, but it opens the window for another types of the equity injections to the, to the equity. So we, we hope it will help the bank to grow much faster. Mm -hmm. um, and returning to the, the idea about uh, their significant 27% share on the mortgage market, it, it, it's huge, even the market is not so big itself, uh, but uh, uh, that, that project gives them the opportunity to do the good cross sales and to work with the clients for a long-term perspective. If someone uh, have the mortgage loan from the bank, it most probably will transfer all the salaries, all the oil banking services to this bank. And moreover, they, his, his, his parents, his child, uh, they all will go to the same bank to get the loan yeah. for their own house. Uh, so this is, even, even, even this program is a subsidized uh, product and they might be not doing the huge profits from this directly, but it's uh, the, the pathway to the uh, additional services, additional clientele, and they could uh, improve it. So with the new new products, with the new know-hows from the advisors, which, which mm -hmm. they are it's definitely a way, a way to the, the more commercialized banking, uh, uh, banking activity of the QQB. Okay.
Um, Ellie, if I can turn to you now, I mean, the point of this privatization, I mean, is to transfer the ownership uh, of these companies to private investors. However, these IPOs, I mean, they're starting with very small stakes and the liquidity on the market, the local, um, the TSC, the Tashkent Stock Exchange, is very limited. So that obviously this process is going to take a long time, years. Um, the other part of doing IPOs um, is to improve the transparency and the corporate governance and the general management of the companies. Uh, the goal here is to make them publicly accountable. I, I talked to um, Papashvili, George Papashvili, who's the new head of um, the new CEO of the TSE, and he was suggesting one of the ways that this privatization could be done is giving the, the workers um, shares as a bonus to get them personally invested in the future of the company. And also the company itself is then publicly accountable because it has to go through the reporting process. It has to answer to shareholders, albeit they minority ones. And Artel um, has not done an IPO, but you have recently issued, I think it's the first big corporate bonds or one of the biggest on the, the market. And so you've had to go through this whole transparency, corporate governance, restructuring, to be, you know, on a par with international standards, um, reporting on, an, on, a, on a corporate, um, on a capital market to, to investors into your bonds. I mean, can you describe a little bit, you know, what that meant? I mean, I know talking to you before that it's actually meant quite a lot of work and they, uh, they have to get their heads around it, but what did that actually look like? Yeah, I mean, um, for those that don't know Artel, we're a, um, a, a huge, a, a or a very large manufacturer of um, home appliances here in Uzbekistan and also um, within Central, Central Asia. And um, you're completely right. I think we have, um, ob obviously we're in a very different position. We're a 100% private company. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is that before, um, I think it was 2019 tax reforms, companies like ours couldn't grow above a certain size. So actually we were several companies all, all kind of linked together, basically correlating to various, um, to various geographical or um, geographical kind of locations or areas of expertise. And so it was only after 2019 that we could consolidate our entities and then bring in um, what we would say modern corporate governance practices into um, Artel Electronics LLC, what, what became the, um, the holding group above it. And yeah, I mean, that, that consolidation process took at least 18 months, just legally going through that process. Um, and then following that, but it, it was only following that that we were able to, you know, account for ourselves professionally for the first time. So to kind of have a set of consolidated accounts that we could then get audited um, for, you know, the, um, three years and that was, that was done last year. Um, and then off the back of that, we can get, you know, a fitch rating and can do um, get a fitch rating and can refinance internationally and uh, and issue a bond um, on the local um, stock exchange. And then in terms of corporate governance, um, you know we've we've been able to we've been able to bring in a supervisory board and audit committees and 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 all of the things that go with that. It, it's not been without its challenges, of course. I mean there are um, you know it's it's a very new thing to the market and to Artel. So slowly um, people are getting used to it. I mean, even on a basic level, kind of trying to organize regular meetings in Uzbekistan can be, can be difficult. <laughs> but, um, you know, slowly that culture is becoming embedded um, in, in the company. And um, I think we're seeing, um, or Artel is seeing huge, um, huge uh, kind of positive impact from investing early in that, um, in that process. So you've already put into place something like IFRS uh, international accounts, and the first ones are coming out. They're out already, or they're coming out soon? No, last year, last year, so twenty twenty one. So we had our first year, uh, our first three years worth of consolidated. Right, and the group, the group has got very big. Um, I remember going through this process in in Russia in the early two two thousands, and one of the things the managers were saying to me is that look, we've got to a size now where. Corporate governance is not just something nice that we want to show to foreign investors. It's become essential as a business process. You know, we have to internally clamp down on corruption and so um, and you know malpractices and inefficiency as well. So just measuring the performance of the business. And so we need transparent, believable accounts for ourselves. And that I think the big companies in Uzbekistan, yourself included, or maybe as a leading example, have reached that point where you've got so large 
that you need to have all these international things in there simply for the sake of management, really, running the company efficiently. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I think I think completely. So it's not it's not just you, you don't just do it to tick a kind of ESG box. I think one benefits not only because you're hitting those those those, those metrics that investors and financial institutions are 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 looking for, but you're you're also internally um, in internally you have better oversight, or at least when you have these committees and supervisory boards and things, you have better oversights of what is going on and what is effective, and it allows you to plan strategically more effectively as well. Mm -hmm. Can I open the same question up to everyone, to all four of you, in so much as this is a key part of this privatization drive. It's not simply to, you know, put private investors into in charge of these companies, because that's going to be a long, slow process. It's also a process of improving transparency and governance um, and accountability. And one of the complaints you hear in Uzbekistan is, you know, despite all the, the, the reforms and um, the progressive ideas that the government's introduced, that the state does stay in control and you want to get away from the ability of someone being able to pick up the telephone and order something to happen because now all these companies are accountable to shareholders and so that actually sort of slows that process down i mean um with the two with the three companies uh uzavto um and uzmet um combinat i mean they are you know former well in, in Uzmet's case, I mean, it's a former Soviet company, sort of run on Red Director's Line, and Uzavdo is, is a modern company, but nevertheless was established under Karimov and very, very much run directly by the state. Um, and this process with the IPO is supposed to change that. Well, what's happened in those three companies in terms of uh, improving transparency, accountability, reporting, uh, corporate governance? Yeah, Karen, do you want to go first? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, but, yeah, I can uh, start with yeah, Zato Motors. Um, I'd say that Zato Motors is uh, very uh, different from any other uh, SOE IPOs that will come, uh, that will come soon. Why? Because uh, Uzato Motors is not owned by a government, it's owned by the Uzato Passenger Vehicle Management, which is owned by uh, the Uzato Sanoat, which is then owned by Ministry of Finance. So there are multiple layers of ownership. Mm -hmm. And um, so the decisions are not brought directly by government. That's the first, first thing. And second about the uh, transformation process of the uh, accountability and other things. Uh, Uzato Motors has the um, has issued year bonds before last year. So they are doing the IFRS twice a year. And um, Uzap Motors is actually one of the key companies that are doing, uh, uh, that are actually doing accounting in IFRS and not just, um, not just converting the um, accounting from local standards to IFRS. Right. So they also have their, of course, they have their international yeah. ratings, uh, B plus. So uh, they have uh, financial covenants, which come from uh, Euro bonds as well as their um, reporting. And covenants, and they are actually on the way to uh, deliver their first uh, ESG report uh, by by the end of this year. Right, and Karen, is it the same as the other two? The bank and the was met. <clears throat> yeah, the same, same, same good direction and and uh, the way for improving, but definitely a bit, a bit different for each one. For example, the. <clears throat> Uzmet Kambinat, they have a new team, new management team, including a few uh, expats uh, on, on the key positions. They have, uh, uh, they just got uh, the Fitch rating. They are working constantly with the institutional, foreign uh, financial institutions, like big ones, uh, expert agencies like Saatchi, like Hermé, mm -hmm. uh, who will be financing the projects. So it's, it's, it requires a lot of a lot of efforts on on approving the ESG agenda, the financial positions, the quality of the management. They they have the definitely all of them. Three companies have the IFRS reporting, uh, and uh, Uzmet is going to do the first ESG rating as well. Maybe not not so so fast as Uzafta, but definitely maybe this mm -hmm. year, maybe in the beginning of the next one. And for the bank, I guess it's much much better because the banks already had the. Uh, requirements to do the IFRS reporting since 1994, I guess might be wrong a bit, uh, but still they are working with this for quite a long time. They are tracking the million of 
different credit lines from the uh, foreign institutions, foreign banks, development institutions, the ADB is helping them, the AY wrote the strategy. Uh, and just an example, they have uh, the majority of the independent board members in their supervisory board, and three of them are foreigners with a very good uh, and, uh, and, and deep background in the, in the finance. Uh, so everything of this means that there is a very good improvement in the system in general. Right. Definitely, there is a huge, huge part of the things which working in the in the old way. But the good thing is the management and the board and the owners, the shareholders, the union and the government, they all understand the problems and they are doing the step by step process to to solve this issue. Okay. Aziz, if I can turn to you, I mean, from the government point of view, because at the end of the day, um, these SOEs are very much owned by the state, and this process is right at the very beginning. But the state's attitude is to get out, and that you want to see all of these um, transparency, corporate governance improve, um, as you see a, a way of developing the economy. I mean, well, what's the what's the vision of the government in terms of these privatizations? Um, for sure. You know, the IPOs and SPOs are one of the most prototype assets uh, during um, and going through this and this project the uh, state owned companies banks of course in uh, corporate governance the lead into improvement in finance their financial uh, and as a regulator of capital markets uh, uh, we are we also uh, we are interested in is because uh, our market there will be more companies who are listed for investors uh, and the more uh, the, uh, high quality assets investors and uh, uh, the, on the other side uh, if, if the companies uh, the uh, um, management and governance for all they, they will they will be kind of uh, uh, more efficient in their financial performance. They will uh, less require in the financial. Okay, so you're breaking up your sound a little bit, but I, I got most of that to, to produce more high quality assets to uh, help the development of the capital market and at the same time improve the management performance of the, of the companies. But then that brings us on to the key question here: um, is that these IPOs um, people are talking about around 5% of each going to be offered on the Tashkent exchange um, to predominantly retail investors. And just looking at the Ozefto, um, uh valuation of 2.8 billion, um, the amount of money that's going to be needed to get 5% away is quite kind of large. And the trouble with the Uzbek equity market is that there's not really very many retail investors. I mean, Karen and... Um, Veracruz, uh, you both have brokerages, you do have uh, local clients, but um, given you've got three pretty large IPOs coming at once, um, is there enough liquidity on the market? Is there enough money amongst retail investors to afford this? I, I forget who told me, I, I think it might have been Karen or um, Pavishvili, that if, you, if all the investors, the retail investors, sold their entire portfolio to go into cash to get ready for these IPOs, they could probably cover the us after issue twice over and that what that means is that in order to get these ipos away you're going to actually have to uzbekistan or the tsc is going to have to attract new liquidity from retail investors in other words people are going to take some of the five billion they've got in savings under the mattress out and put them into equities how, how much of an issue is the liquidity um, and does it mean that they won't get 5% away, they might get 2% away or 1% away. Um, what, what's the plan here? Yeah, so the plan is we are actually doing it. Uh, so uh, all those IPOs have uh, up to 5%, not, uh, it's not necessarily 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for Zalto IPO, Zalto Motors IPO, we decided that we're doing at least $30 million and we'll see how the book goes. So it's uh, up from $30 million of volume um to up to 98 million dollars so um as for is the liquidity there, goes 
Yeah, is yeah. there that much money? Is this thirty to ninety million? Uh, currently, uh, currently, I um, I don't really think so that uh, there is uh, so much money in the existing brokerage accounts. But the thing is, there hasn't been much going on in the Uzbek capital markets be before this IPOs. The most exciting companies we had are just just, just there were there were just a couple of companies that was made company not which which didn't have much of the free float and uh, the commodity exchange which also didn't have much of the free float so we only had just like a couple of blue chips so there ha have been a, has been in, in many many investors coming to the market mm. so with the with those real blue chips coming to list to ipo uh, we think that we'll have much more liquidity so uh, as for south for example we without motors for example we think that our our brokerage account retail brokerage accounts amount will triple during this ipo so and that's just for retail accounts and for as for institutional demand uh there hasn't been any real institutional demand for previous public offerings, but for those offerings, we see now and then a lot of emails and requests to have a call coming. So uh, institutional investors are interested in these ideas. So as you know, for Lada, you're talking about international institutional investors or yes, yes, right. international and uh, local. So as you know. And the largest uh, equity offering, public equity offering so far, has been just uh, one and a half million dollars. That has been the SPO of Quartz, and we were the uh, we were uh, underwriting the deal. So um, it, it wasn't enough to test the real liquidity of the market. Let's say right. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. So, tell me, Karen, uh, the QQB and the uh, Uzma Combinat, uh, cash wise, how much cash? Is the is the share the five percent stake worth, or do you have a minimum as well that you're trying to get? Uh, yeah, we 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 have this up to five uh, thing, um, and I guess because it was right, we will see on on existing demand uh, and decide how much we want to sell. I probably cannot uh, say you the exact numbers, but probably uh, Uzmet might be somewhere. Closer to 25, 30 million, and uh, QQB is very small, uh, about maximum 10 million, probably, uh, because we all understand how uh, illiquid the market is, especially for the banking shares. Uh, we have some uh, infrastructure for this, which is going to be solved uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the future. Uh, but still, still, we think that the local uh investors will actively participate mm. uh, and the, but but at the same time the main part of the, the placement might be considered to play to be allocated to the foreign institutional investors because we see on the practice the all the the names that Bifus mentioned the, the commodity exchange other companies first two years when the companies was growing very fast most of the trades was done by the foreign institutions and then when the people saw that the there is a growth, there is uh, some opportunity and additional profits comparing to the bank deposits, they started to invest locally. Uh, so the, the, the foreigners is a very important part of this process, especially institutionals, some hedge funds. Uh, we understand that the big guys will not come. So at this point, but small frontier oriented uh, hedge funds is a very good and very target investments uh, group for us. So it is possible then. So adding that up, that sounds to me like, like you know the total starting package um, for the three companies is something on the order of seventy million, which in the grand scheme of things is not a lot of money for international investors, even though it's probably absorb all of the liquidity from the domestic retail investors. Um, and there are funds working on the Uzbek market. I mean, there's there's a uh, AFC Capital and uh, Karen through your uh, Avesta, you, you've got people who've invested directly as well and and some of the big international banks like jb morgan have representative offices in tashkent but at the moment those big international famous investment banks are largely focused on doing corporate bonds uh with the big euro bond business with with the large blue chips they're not um they're, they're not um, they're not offering you know frontier market equity investments at this stage are they that's either of you yeah 
Yeah, uh, uh, definitely all these big banks and uh, big investments companies, they're all looking for Uzbekistan. They are interested, they like the companies, uh, but they have their own compliance and the requirements on, on the size of the fees that they want to get. Uh, so it's difficult now to uh, have all the big players here. So uh, we are going to our partners, in, in, including uh, foreign ones, and we will be cooperating on the local market with other brokerage to maximally consolidate the, 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 the market and increase the possible demand for each of these uh, IPOs uh, mm. going to, to be in the next few months or the years. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge, but it's very realistically, we could do it very, very successfully. Um, so just just need to have a bit of the courage to, to cover mm. everything. That, that's, a, that's a huge and difficult word, but it's definitely worth it. And we believe that uh, the market will be very sure. successful. Aziz, if I can ask you, I mean, you know, as the IPO creation uh, department at the uh, MinFin, uh, have you actually been actively wooing international investors, going to frontier funds, talking to big uh, London, New York based investment banks and offering them, hey, we're doing an IPO, this should be very interesting. We're going to offer them a discount and these companies are fast growing, like, why don't you come and participate? Um, yes, yeah, sure. As a minister of finance, uh, we usually... Uh, we usually do kind of, uh, strong investor relations with uh, investment banks like uh, Raiffeisen Bank and uh, other frontier market uh, investment funds. Uh, the, in, in May this year, we made a kind of, uh, uh, nice non deal launch banner in London uh, where we presented uh, uh, with after mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with Medcam Milan's here. They, the, and together with our uh, the colleagues from the, that SOEs, we present the, the plans for IPOs to international investors. Yes, investors, and, yeah. and we got quite a uh, feedback from them, so positive. And uh, given that uh, um, uh, the, let's say, adverse effect of the geopolitical situation, national capital markets particularly in the markets. So um, at, at the moment, we we only focus on uh, local listings. But of course, uh, uh, in coming years, maybe we're also planning uh, international IPOs of some SOEs. Yeah, Ellie, can I ask you about that? Because I know Artel, I mean, they've done the corporate bonds already um, in on the TSE in, in Tashkent, but um, I understand the ambition is to go and do a euro bond. Um, and, and what's your experience of reaching out to internationally and to what extent are you finding there's interest uh, from the international audience? Because the plan here with the IPOs is to do SBOs and go to the international markets. And so this whole exercise is basically a calling card ahead of that effort, which is going to develop in the next few years. And you're in the same boat, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. Um, we were targeting a euro bond either next year or the year after. I think that was our kind of realistic, uh, realistic aim. Obviously, since, since February, for obvious reasons, we have, uh, we're playing, playing by ear a little bit because of um, market however you know people are very very interested in stories from Uzbekistan I think people are seeing or nowadays see very very few kind of untapped markets mm. where there's a huge amount of potential for um, for growth so we as a bank as as a bank sorry as a company we have seen that the doors to um, the doors to kind of like you know investors and banks and people have been have been completely open and we've been able to have those 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 conversations very early on and that's saying that there is there is interest obviously for um i mean I, I, as i said market conditions aren't aren't quite right for it and we also need to um strengthen i think our tail needs to grow a little bit more before it um before it issues a bond obviously our target is is london at some point but um we successfully um issued a a small bond, and we were the first private, well, the first 100% private company. I mean, Karen can correct me if I'm wrong, 
but mm. um, but we were the the the, the first large scale private company to um, to do so in um, in Tashkent, and that went really well. And um, but again, that's on the domestic market. So so we've got to. Um, I, I, I think we've got to wait and see, basically. <laughs> to, what, to what extent do you think, like, um, Uzbekistan, I mean, famously, when Mirozoyev came in um, in 2016 and he opened the market up again after, you know, Karimov had it shut down. And I think by 2018, it started to become very clear that this was a good idea that uh, Uzbekistan was taking off, that you come to Tashkent, I was down there then, and there was a noticeable buzz. And I was just down there again, like, uh, last week, two weeks ago. Uh, and you can feel it's coming on. I mean, the, 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 it, it's going. And I think the story is getting out slowly that, you know, it's not it's a very prospective market. And as you say, I think it's one of the, the few really upbeat stories in the whole former Soviet Union space. Um, but to what extent do you think that that is transmitted outside, that people are starting to wake up and say, oh, we have to keep an eye on this. It's actually very early days, but um, this should be very interesting if it goes the way that the other markets have gone. Um, I, I, I think over the last year or so that has really um, come through because it's very easy for uh, a kind of administration to come in and say they're going to reform and change everything. But actually people were kind of, you know, s s sitting back and seeing whether that, that process was, was real. And now I think it's very clear that it is real. And, you know, the government are very, very committed to the privatisation process. I think, like any of these things, it's not necessarily a smooth journey. You know, there's a kind of like, you run, you kind of test different things out, you see what works, you see what doesn't work. But I think the interest, we've definitely seen it over the last year, we're getting more people knocking on our doors, more people, um, mm. more people getting in contact, more people expressing interest. And I think, and, and that's not just from a kind of financing perspective, but also from a partnership perspective, from a supply, you know, Perspective. And I, th I think it's because people are, people now have trust in the process in a way that a couple of years ago, they were probably sitting back and just, you know, letting it take its course and see and, and see whether the government would follow through with what it was saying it wanted to do. Okay, look, um, we're coming in towards the end. Um, I, I want to ask a, a last question about the IPO process. Um, the key one, Mark Gabin has brought it up in the questions, and I am looking at them. I'll see at this time for answer more of these questions. But the pricing uh, of these IPOs is going to be key. The, the point being um, that you've got to, of course, the stakeholders want to take out as much money as they can, but at the same time, the um, the, the issue has to leave enough money on the table, particularly for the retail investors, so they see some upside. Because if they don't make money out of this, then um, that will scupper the whole privatization thing and development of the domestic stock market from the beginning. And I think everybody has at the back of their mind what happened to the Russian bank BTB when they did their people's IPO. And then within 12 months, it tanked. And those shares are still half the price of what they were at the IPO. And the Russian retail investors put a billion dollars into that IPO and got burnt. Uh, and that's weighed on the Russian stock market ever since. It's taken 20, 25 years until the Russian retail investors finally were convinced to start investing into the stock market, which really took off about two years ago. And again, they've now been burnt because of the war and they've lost a lot of money. And so this issue with these initial pricings, given the, um, how, how uh, immature this market is and how um, how inexperienced the Uzbek retail investor is, um, that getting the pricing level right to leave some money on the table is key. I mean, maybe um, uh, there, there was, we could start with you because you were saying that the, the 2.8 valuation uh, and Karen as well, that you were offering a 10 to 20% discount, I think you said, um, that the pricing is going to be relatively attractive uh, for these first rounds and all said and done I mean they're offering relatively small chunks of shares so I think you can afford to be generous isn't it worth investing at this stage in pricing at the low end to make sure that everybody who does do this gets a uh, gets a decent profit yeah so uh, first of all yeah the pricing is 2.18 uh, billion not 2.8 and uh, we're placing it with a discount range of 10 to 20 percent and uh, as for the as for the knowledge of uh, retail investors, um, we as a company are caring about uh, are doing about a hundred 
um, investor education events uh, annually in Uzbekistan. And we so are, that's like uh, a domestic roadshow where you're going around villages and towns and just inviting regular people in to tell them about what an IPO is and the advantages of equity. Yeah, what the stock market is and how to invest in the stock market. So we're doing about 100 of those events uh, annually. And so we're doing this. We're the only brokerage with an extensive um, um, uh, with an extensive offices network, which is spread across all of the country. So we're doing these uh, IP, uh, so all these education events in all of the regions of Uzbekistan. And of course, when there are uh, there is an IPO or a bond offering, uh, we're doing um, simultaneously we're doing the investor education events. So after they are educated, we are telling about, about the offering, so then they know what they're investing in. Karen, same for you. I mean, you're going to bring these IPOs out at um, a cheap price. Um, yeah, so uh, we we, we not, don't have the valuations yet, so we are just just in the process. But uh, we probably will be will be targeting uh, not something like discount of this from the from the value or something. We will we will look on the prices that we think that the the market will accept. Uh, with and we are looking for successful IPO, not just in terms of placing the shares and forget about this. Uh, we are aiming to the that type of the IPO which will be successful in the long term. So the all investors will have a chance to get the profits. Uh, so we will very conservatively um, uh, evaluate the, the future future of these companies and provide the maximum information to them. So we want that this IPOs will be very successful, everyone got the profit, and then invite others to, to, to join the party. Because we, we have, as, as, as Aziz uh, was telling us, we have 21 companies to go uh, yeah. in the next year or so. Uh, so this, this, this three ones should open the, 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 the trailblazers for the market. Because if you're selling it to um, international investors, you don't need to offer a discount. The story is like this is a frontier market and that this is a good company and just the future growth yeah, is going to give you just, more. Just foreigners will not allow us to do the, the, the one type of the IPO I told you. Uh, foreigners will mostly keep it for next, let's say, five years. So it's yeah. not it's the liquidity to the market. So this is this is the challenge for us to do the proper allocation between the institutional investors, which will give us the volume of the placements, and the retail, local, institutional, uh, foreign investors who will be trading the shares tomorrow, who will be buying this, selling this every day to promote. Like the key is the liquidity. Now mm -hmm. we see that the liquidity is very low on the market, and we want with this IPOs to increase it like five, ten times at least. I'm just scrolling through the questions in the last five minutes, and um, one point someone brought up um, was that the market remains, despite the opening up that uh, Mir Mirozoya has brought in, uh, the market remains uh, pretty closed. And someone like Uz Afto has benefited because they're very high duties, I think 100% uh, duties on the import of other cars. And although at the presentation, um, the deputy director was saying that the tariffs duties have been reduced and twice already, and there's going to be another reduction um, in January. And so the market's being opened up for more competition. Um, this is still very early days in the whole process and in Uzbekistan's transformation. And something like Uzavdo uh, enjoys something of a monopoly and a protected monopoly. Uh, and the government is putting through reforms very fast, but um, you know there's still big problems like this. And there's at the economic forum, um, I heard one investor was asking, you know, all right, it was uh, Afdal has a virtual monopoly now, um, but eventually, if those tariffs are taken off, what will happen then? Is this really such a good investment? Uh, because to what extent is it really a sort of self-contained, vertically integrated company? Uh, yeah, so Bruce, what I you can, think, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, so I can address this question. Uh, so uh, there are no protective tariff, uh, there is no government protection on Zata Motors whatsoever. The, um, uh, the uh, current system in Uzbekistan is done so that any company, any automotive company can come to Uzbekistan and localize the production, uh, the production here so that they will um, uh, they'll have the same opportunities as Uzauto Motors in this market. Um, 
the tariffs on uh, imports of new cars are uh, possible uh, will possibly be reduced in the future by half uh, but um, even if they are removed completely um, even if they are uh, removed completely if you import the new cars uh, uh, the new uh, other manufacturers will be faced with uh, will face competition with Zalta Motors extensive um, extensive dealership network mm -hmm. uh, the possibilities the abilities of us automotors to uh, supply the um, alpha parts 24 7 across all of the regions of the country and other uh, car manufacturer uh, other car makes can wait months for the required parts to come to replace so uh there, there are over 150,000 people working in all of the um car uh, all, um, auto parts making uh companies in the Uzato Sanoat network which uh, then supply those uh, parts to Uzato Motors so no, and it's, it's, it's an not easy yes it's not easy to service, build that yeah. Extensive yeah. service network too, 200. I mean, that's key. That's important to everyone is being able to get your car fixed. But yeah, so um, it look, will take years to, to compete yeah. with Zato if one yeah. wants to or enter the market. No, exciting. I'm sort of very curious to see what happens. Um, very last parting thoughts. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but um, so if everyone, uh, if you have something to say, a short, short comment. But um, I think all the companies, uh, Artel included, is setting up a, a factory in Kazakhstan. Ozavdo now has significant number of uh, its cars are sold uh, in Kazakhstan. And this is one of the, um, the really exciting prospects is um, the regional integration. And Kazakhstan is the obvious place to go because it's by far the richest of the other stands, uh, twice or two and a half times richer than Uzbekistan itself. Um, but to what extent is the region now finally coming together after all those years of rivalry between the various presidents as a new guard in charge? And that as a, a larger market, it's much more interesting. And it now sits once again, like it did in Victorian times, at a strategic crossroads between East and West, when East and West mean something again. So to what extent is, is, is Central Asia becoming this one market? Because um, everyone's business plan is looking like that. I don't know, I, I, Ellie. I mean, you 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 uh, you actually actively or were actively going to build a vacuum cleaner factory in uh, in Kazakhstan. Are those plans still going ahead? Um, those plans are currently um, on hold, but we're looking at other options at the moment. Um, but no, we are we are both exporting and mm. working with various partners in other um, in other regions. Um, sorry, other countries in the region. And I think for us. Um, I, I can't necessarily speak to the, the geopolitics, but at least for us, I mean, we're finding that logistically investing in and working with Uzbekistan allows you very, very easy access to the rest of the region. And I think, I mean, we're a home appliance manufacturer, right? And we're the biggest in the region, which means for us, it's quite easy and um, easy to penetrate those markets. But I think, um, but I think we are seeing um, a kind of, growth in in regional trade and i think it's a really positive thing for Uzbekistan. right and as it's for, uh, go ahead yeah as far as auto motors uh it's not just doing like uh, um you've asked about the regional integration so um as far as auto motors it's not just doing the sup sales in other cis countries it has already built uh, uh, semi down production in Kazakhstan and uh, Azerbaijan, and it is planning to do so in uh, um, in Turkmenistan and uh, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, and and uh, and is looking to expand into the Middle East. So, when I was first in Uzbekistan in '95, I mean that's the investors were all coming there first. I mean this is before Kazakhstan made all its money from oil, and because it's the natural production center, uh, natural production center for the whole of the five stands it's the only one that has a border with all the others and it has the largest population by far um so you can build your production and then export to the neighboring countries um isn't, isn't that one of the appeals of this that will drive the um the growth even faster karen what do you think uh yeah the, the market might, might be growing much, much faster here now because uh as, as mentioned during the economic forum the uh, there we, we see the start of the structural reforms. Uh, let, let, for example, a uh, very small example, no one, no one, no one noted it. Uh, 
uh, for nine months in third quarter, the export non gold export from Uzbekistan the first time exceeded the growth rates of the import. So mm. all this previous five years of the significant import, which was half is the machineries. Uh, at least turning to the starting of the production of the export oriented products. So we was export, importing the equipment, which now started to work. And in future, the, the gap between the import and export will uh, will be much more narrow and we will have a smaller trade deficit. So this is the one very, very top line example of how the country is, is changing. So uh, we could speak for hours for each of the segments, which is going, going through this uh the very similar process great guys um we've run out of time we've had our hour um i'd like to thank you very much um everyone Beruz, uh, karen ellie and aziz for, for joining us very interesting i'm super curious to see how these uh these ipos go and and even if they don't go that well i mean just the mere start and the the, the preparation that's gone into doing it um will lead to more corporate bonds euro bonds what have you um and, and the development. I mean, it's a long, long road. Uh, looking around the region and watching the development of the other countries, it's taken a decade. And I think Uzbekistan is still at the very early stages of that. But it's definitely stepped off step one, square one into square two. So once again, thank you all for, for, for participating. Fascinating combination, uh, conversation. And for viewers, um, if you want to see this uh, again or you want to share it with your friends, you can find a copy of the uh, the podcast on our on our YouTube channel, BE and Telenews. Um, also, if you go to bne.eu or intellinews.com slash welcome, there you can find various other things. Uh, a link to the uh, YouTube channel is there. You can also sign up for Editor's Picks, which is our free daily digest of our best stories from the last 24 hours. Um, and if you're a professional and interested in finding out more about Uzbekistan, we report on it daily. Um, you can then take a trial to our pro service where we um, uh, have that in 30 other countries, plus now all of Africa. So once again, thank you very much for uh, to spending the time and I hope to see you again next time. All the best.